Introducing Psychological Research When we say research, maybe the first thing you think of is an extended stay at the library, all-nighter spent scouring the internet for articles hidden behind tables, piles of your drafts marked with red ink pens to indicate needed revisions, and groupmates messaging you, Uy, nasa na yung part na ikaw yung magsusunat. It's no surprise then that many find research to be a scary task that no one will willingly imagine a research career for themselves. Well, this lesson aims to change that, or at least make research less scary. This lesson is about why you should do research and what science and psychology have to do with it. So, why do we do research? We can start with four reasons. We do research every day for everything. We usually think of research as something that scientists and specialized professionals do, but at its core, research is all about collecting information in order to answer a question and give solutions to the problem that started our investigation. For example, when you were thinking about college, why did you choose to take your current degree program when there were others? You most likely considered your interests and future career prospects. Maybe you ask your family, friends, and significant others what they think. Maybe your life circumstances led you to ask if you'd be able to go to college in the first place. Again, all of these are information that you use to answer the problem, what degree program should I take? We can list a lot of problems we face in everyday life and all the information we research to make a reasonable decision. When selecting food, we look at the calories and nutritional content or if it would taste good. When leaving the house, how early we should go to account for traffic or whether to go out at all. When a friend says something out of character, you consider where they are coming from and what unusual circumstances could have pushed them over the edge. Well, you get the idea. And psychologists have noted that people do try to make sense of everything by asking questions about themselves, others, and the world they live in. Social psychologist Fritz Heider said that we are naive scientists who ask again and again, why do people behave the way they do? From this, we come to have common sense psychological beliefs that we use to explain the motivations, intentions, and goals of others. Personality psychologist George Kelly puts it more simply. We are persons as scientists who take information, make informed guesses about how people in the world work, test out these hypotheses, and make conclusions based on our experiences. Of course, Making conclusions solely based on our experiences can lead to skewed conclusions because we behave relative to our interpretations of the world and not exactly things as they happen. So, what makes psychological and scientific research different from common sense psychology? Both actually serve the same purposes. Research in psychology aims to describe what is happening to us and the world around us, explain what processes and causes lead to these occurrences, Predict what will happen in the future using what explanations and relationships we believe give rise to these actions, and apply insights from research to modify our behaviors and make our lives better. However, psychological research just happens to be more systematic, going beyond our individual lenses and making the perspectives of many people meet in the middle. Research allows us to get more accurate, thus more useful information. Common sense psychology does derive information from many sources of knowledge, but they're all limited in ways that make them not as accurate or useful as insights coming from psychological research. Sometimes, we get information from tenacity. These are the habits, beliefs, ideologies, and superstitions that are passed down and circulated around society. These include everything from the well-intentioned not going to bed with your hair wet at the risk of headaches or blurred vision, to the more concerning not going home immediately after visiting awake at the risk of the deceased following you home. In other cases, we make decisions based on gut feel intuitions or our selective interpretations of our own experiences. We also get swayed by the opinions of experts on particular topics or by popular bandwagon appeals towards certain preferences. Of course, though these sources might be useful in making trivial choices, they all suffer from common problems that render them inaccurate. One problem is confirmation bias, 
we are prone to remember when the advice given by these sources work and ignore the cases when they don't. So, even if they prove to be false, we keep on holding on to them despite lack of evidence. Another is the present-present bias. Did following the suggestions given by these sources actually lead to the desirable ends we got? Or is something else at play? These sources are not good at identifying what processes are actually working to give good results and ruling out what is irrelevant. We also have biased blind spots. Authorities and bandwagons, just like everyone else, can have preferences which color their opinions. Biases, when left unchecked, can lead to advice that don't work for everyone or reflect only the limited lenses of the people they come from. Two other sources of knowledge are actually part of how we do research at present, and they come from psychology's long philosophical history. Rationalism, based on the ideas of theory of forms Plato and René Cogito Ergo Sum Descartes, emphasized that knowledge is derived from how we think about things and how we process information to come up with new conclusions. Indeed, English philosopher John Stuart Mill and German physiologist turned psychology founder Wilhelm Wundt talked about creative synthesis, or how complex ideas can be placed to the organization of more basic thoughts. Nowadays, rationalism lives on through the process of deduction. When we have an overarching explanation for why things happen, we derive specific predictions that follow from these overall theories, which we then apply to specific situations. You'd usually see deductions in if-then format, or a series of premises which, when linked, lead to a conclusion. Meanwhile, empiricism, as can be seen in the writings of Potentiality Actuality Aristotle, John Tabula Rasselock, and Francis Scientific Matthew Bacon, argued for the opposite side. Knowledge can come only from experience and observation of the world. Makes sense. You need observations that become knowledge first before you can organize anything. In the present, the process of induction does something similar. We create explanations based on generalizations or a conclusion informed by seeing what's similar among a lot of observations. However, both rationalism and empiricism have limitations too, but of a different kind. That is, like tenacity, intuition, experience, authority, and bandwagons, rationalism and empiricism are helpful only to the extent that the original knowledge content is actually true or valid. But at the same time, these two only result in acceptable explanations if the process of reasoning used to reach a conclusion is valid as well. For example, you could say that these sources are limited so they will run out when they get used up. Then someone may come up and add that happiness is a resource. So does that mean we should stop people being happy so we won't run out of happiness in the world? Here's another case. It's rained for the past five days, and you need an umbrella to not get wet. Can you conclude that you need an umbrella tomorrow? The process of deducting happiness conservation is valid based on philosophical principles of argumentation, but the content of the argument is not, so you ended up with a weird conclusion. Also, predicting if it will rain tomorrow relies on accurate data, but a faulty process. You can't assume certainty in induction because you can only conclude as much as what your data tells you. So it's possible that it will rain, but we can't be certain if it would. Okay, if these sources of knowledge have their own merits and limits, then what does science rely on to make reasonably good conclusions? We have the scientific method, a systematic process of identifying questions, acquiring information, and making conclusions. Different sources list different steps, but the process goes something like this. Observe the world and look for a problem you want to solve. Make a hypothesis or informed prediction about why things are the way they are. Collect data to test how well your prediction holds up. Then analyze your results to make a conclusion. Whether you can support or need to refine or refute your hypothesis, the scientific method loops back. Your findings can inspire new questions or allow research in the future to look somewhere else for answers. Science is an iterative source and process of knowledge creation, so it's a never-ending question and answer cycle. We use research to know ourselves and our society more, so we can make better decisions and changes that benefit us in the long run. We've been talking about science as if it's just a source of knowledge, but really, science is also a process of thinking about the world, 
and it is run by people who respond to the needs of the society in which they are present. Indeed, psychology has responded to three contexts which shape how we do research. Our historical context, the progression of thinkers, theories, and technologies, influence what explanations we make and what methods we use in our studies. For example, psychology borrowed heavily from chemistry, physics, and other natural sciences from the 1800s to the 1900s when deciding which methods are most useful in unraveling the mysteries of the human mind. Because of this, we ended up relying on experiments, objective surveys, and other quantitative methods, which are also the staple of natural science studies. But in the 1970s, brought about by the civil rights and feminist movements and the Stonewall riots, psychologists and researchers across the social sciences realized even more that reducing human experiences to numbers just isn't enough to make sense of the complex times in which we live. Thus, the qualitative revolution brought about the return of interviews, phenomenology, focus group discussions, and other narrative-based methods. The qualitative revolution is also a good example of psychology's second context, the sociocultural environment. The zeitgeist, the spirit of the times, tells us whether a particular method or research topic is appropriate, prioritized, or even relevant given the needs and interests of a particular society or culture. For example, psychological research is often described as weird, reflecting the typical characteristics of most published studies relying on Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic samples. Then, post-colonial liberation psychologies in the 1970s and large-scale migration and globalization across the decades pushed social scientists to grapple with cultural diversity in their studies. With that, research based on weird people are no longer applicable, relevant, or even enough for an increasingly international psychology. The last context concerns the moral implications of our research. Psychology is not only a scientific endeavor that aims to investigate human behavior and educate students. It is also a practice aimed at individual well-being and advocacy towards positive social change. The findings of psychology can be used for both good and evil. Insights into human functioning have been instrumental in promoting gender sensitivity, the stigmatization of mental illnesses, and humane justice systems, inasmuch as it has been abused to support racism, homophobia, and dehumanization. For instance, findings in psychological testing and neuroscience have been used to justify the discrimination of African Americans and immigrants in the United States arguing that their scores in culturally inappropriate intelligence tests are symptomatic of their intellectual, genetic, and neural inferiority. The same problematic arguments have been used to rationalize eugenics, colonialism, cultural hegemony, and social inequalities across the years. In the Philippines alone, national psychological associations have spoken out on issues of the misuse and politicization of psychological tests, the assertion of embracing diversity in sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression, and the role of psychology in empowering democracies through citizenship and responsive governance. Simply, psychology is not a field existing independent of the world around it. Psychology exists within, responds, and contributes to the people, societies, and cultures it studies. Research shows us the limits of what we know and motivates us to understand and make people realize what we don't. Science is often viewed as the arbiter of truth, the absolute and eternal facts of the universe. But this isn't the case. Science works in terms of probabilities, not certainties. What does that mean? Science and psychology, by extension, has four characteristics. First, science is objective or at least transparent and reflexive. Scientific objectivity does not mean the complete absence of bias, but an awareness of what could possibly skew our conclusions, which we then use to minimize how our perceptions can influence the data. Next, as an empirical endeavor, the conclusions that science comes up with ultimately rely on what information is available, whether we create explanations based on what we observe or by putting together what findings and insights we've had in the past, our theories fundamentally rely on what evidence we have. As a consequence, science is probabilistic. As philosopher Karl Popper argues, our scientific findings are cumulative yet tentative and falsifiable. For example, the statement all swans are white can be true. Even if you see one, one hundred, or one million white swans, 
it will never prove that all swans are white because it's likely you've missed a billion other swans. And if one of those swans turned out to be black, then your statement is falsified. Remember when we said that modern scientific research uses both induction by generalization and deduction by hypothesis testing? Well, our field also relies on a third process, abduction, how our explanations are best guesses of what's actually happening in the world as constrained by what we know. That's what we mean when our explanations are tentative. They are dependent on what evidence we currently have and are strengthened or weakened by what new information we get. The fourth characteristic of science is that it's public. With our findings intended to be shared with other researchers and the general population, to inform not only further studies, but also daily decisions and even public policy. That's why we have the field of scientific communication, which aims to translate the complexities of scientific reports into outputs useful for citizens, policymakers, businesses, and other sectors. And that's where science has another problem. In recent years, anti-intellectualism, science rejectionism, conspiracy theories, and pseudoscientific explanations have gained greater prominence in public attention and influence on policy making. Some, like astrology or phrenology, using the bumps and indentations on the skull as measures of intellectual capacities, are viewed as trivial if not entertaining. But others are more harmful because they have direct impacts on our health system. Vaccines in autism, homeopathy and essential oils, magnetic fields or signal towers in COVID-19, the list goes on. These beliefs are problematic because, by discounting scientific thinking, aggressively attacking dissent, relying on problematic if not fraudulent evidence, and sometimes co-opting scientific sounding jargon to seem legitimate, they lead to greater confusion and division about what solutions or interventions are actually good for us. That's why in teaching the public about science, we don't just talk to them about our discoveries, but also how to be critical in looking at and using information. We call this scientific literacy, the ability to understand how science uses rigorous methods to ask questions and seek answers, and see what science contributes to unraveling and influencing our physical and social worlds. On top of that, scientific literacy is about realizing the limits of our scientific endeavors, thus placing confidence critically on the insights we discover. Kathleen Bish and co researchers tell us that a scientific minded psychologist should then be critical not only about scientific discoveries, but also the process of arriving at them and how they are used in the service of the public. Thus, we contribute knowledge to extend our understanding of our psychological abilities while subjecting these insights to scrutiny by our fellow researchers. At the same time, we consume research to inform our own studies and decisions while examining how our biases and perspectives shape how we view the world. Finally, Psychology and science are deeply situated in society and culture, so we should always consider how they influence research priorities, processes, and application. At this point, it feels like we've been on a roller coaster of emotions and confidence from let science all the things to the science actually work? And what for? And that's okay. Though science can give us a false feeling of all knowingness and all powerfulness, what they actually have is a tentative, imperfect, yet critical perspective in shaping how we do research, education, advocacy, and practice. We are not in possession of unquestionable truth or eternal knowledge. Instead, Martin Schwartz, reflecting on scientific stupidity, says that we bumble along, getting it wrong time after time, and feel perfectly fine as long as we learn something each time. Brian Messick agrees, to be intellectually humble doesn't mean giving up on the ideas we love and believe in. It just means we need to be thoughtful in choosing our convictions, be open to adjusting them, seek out their flaws, and never stop being curious about why we believe what we believe. Partly brought about by the replication crisis, psychologists came to this realization that we have to re-evaluate how we discover and dispense knowledge because public confidence in our endeavors are decreased when we exaggerate findings despite having little evidence to support them. It takes a healthy dose of intellectual humility to admit we're wrong and some scientific stupidity to stay curious in knowing what is right. The claim that we already know this belies the uncertainty of scientific evidence, writes the Open Science Collaboration. Innovation points out paths that are possible, replication points out paths that are likely, progress relies on both.
In this lesson, we discussed why doing research is important by giving four reasons. In doing research every day, we learned about common sense psychology and the naive scientists and persons as scientists metaphors for humans. In comparing different sources of knowledge with the scientific method, we showed how scientific research contributes more accurate and useful information. We looked at the context of psychological research to understand how studies can be used for our benefit, and we rediscovered what it means to be scientific when considering the limitations of science and the spirit of scientific stupidity and intellectual humility. In the next lesson, we'll revisit the scientific method by identifying a general research process that applies for both the quantitative and qualitative traditions, and how this applies to the skill of reading journal articles. See you then!